All right, well, I'm here to talk to you about the wonders of soil resistance and to further drill into your skulls that soil compaction is a big deal. Um, so our soil compaction can be defined as the increase or the densification of a soil at a particular depth, we're decreasing the porosity, therefore less air and water holding capacity. Um, we also decrease our infiltration rates and our root penetration abilities. So unless you plan on paving paradise and putting a parking lot, it is not desirable to have a compacted soil. So we can measure this in a few ways. There's bulk density, there's penetration resistance, and today I really want to focus on penetration resistance as a proxy for soil compaction. That is the res resistance uh, of a soil to a mechanical force. We want to do examine uh, soil resistance both before and after the soil adjustment was made on a reclaimed site. And we want to compare these values to non-plowed areas, ripped areas, and especially to the natural undisturbed forest adjacent to the site. And we want to do this in a spatially explicit way, something not totally common in the land reclamation context. And try and answer some questions. Uh, are we improving the site for plant growth? Are we decompacting the soil? Uh, are we somehow mimicking nature by creating heterogeneity? We don't want a, just a uniform field and grow one thing. We want to have a lot of different microsites on site. And is all this, all these measurements worthwhile? So a little bit about the, the site itself that I'm going to be talking about today. It's a reclaimed remote sump northeast of Peace River in the Cliffdale field. Uh, this area has lots of fine textured soils in the uplands, uh, high clay contents. In 2010, it was recontoured um, and seeded with a grass mixture. And in the spring of 2012, it was ripped with a cat and a McNabb rip plow, this big uh, two bottom plow you can see here, to about a depth of 80 centimeters. And it was planted in 2013 and 2012. So we took measurements in 2012, befo just before it was ripped, um, on the site. And in 2014, we came back and measured on the site and in the forest. And we measured soil resistance using a handheld electronic penetrometer, which are very finicky, horrible instruments to use if you've ever had the pleasure of using one. And they log the kilopascals of pressure every two and a half centimeters uh, in your soil profile as you go into the soil. We also looked at volumetric water content because in general, a wetter soil will be easier to penetrate. So here's our sampling design in, from 2012. Uh, the site can be split up into three main blocks, block one, two, and three. Um, they're roughly about a hectare in size or just under. Uh, we did a five meter grid, a hexagonal tessellation in this case, which is a fancy word just meaning I can draw hexagons around most of those points or all of those points. Um, and uh, these were, I created these data points in the geospatial modeling environment in ArcMap, if you were wondering. Um, 2014, much of the same sampling design, uh, except we switched our sampling from a hexagonal grid to a square grid for whatever reason. Uh, we also have three new blocks in the adjacent forest, forest one, forest two, and forest three. Uh, and you'll notice these gray strips here are control strips. These were not plowed, and they were left unplowed so we could look at vegetation responses over time. So we measured mean, uh, we, we took those volumetric water content measurements and just averaged them out for each block to get an idea of the moisture across the site. Uh, we broke our zero to 30 centimeter resistance measurements into three main depth classes, zero to 10, 10 to 20, and 20 to 30 centimeters. And today I'm gonna focus just on zero to 10 and 10 to 20 centimeters. Although the, the trends from the 10 to 20 centimeters can be carried over into 20 to 30 centimeters as well. Uh, we made box and whisker plots to visualize our data and we looked at that heterogeneity or variation of data with the coefficient of variation as well as a spatial measure called Moran's eye which I'll talk about later. Um, so here's some maps we can make. Uh, this was, I did this in ArcMap, it's just a quick, it's called a natural neighbor interpolation. Uh, it's just a really quick and dirty way to look at some patterns based off those points and look at the site as a whole. Um, so you'll notice I have a table on the bottom left here. This is the volumetric water content. The big thing to note, um, 2012 was wetter than 2014. That's a big, big deal for this project. Um, and you'll also, the other big thing is the forest soils 
are a lot fluffier, uh, which is not really that surprising. Um, you can almost see our control strips popping out in the data a little bit, at least in block two and three. But block one looks to have become more resistant after we plowed it. Um, and our, our, our points, our data points range from less than 500 kilopascals of resistance to almost 2,500 kilopascals. And moving a little deeper in the soil, 10 to 20 centimeters of depth, um, the forest now has become a lot more resistant. We're going up to values of almost 4,000 kilopascals. Uh, our control strips still sort of popping out, at least in block two and block three. But block three and block one are appearing a bit more resistant again. So what's going on there? So I want to look, we can look at maps all day, but we should look at some numbers as well. Um, these are box and whisker plots, and if you're not familiar with them, the thick line in the middle of the box is the median value. Uh, the box represents the two middle quartiles, if you think of the histogram where all the data falls. Um, and the dash line or the whisker on these plots is one and a half the distance of the interquartile range. So basically anything that falls out of that is plotted as an outlier, these little individual dots you see. Um, we have 2014 data in the blue, 2012 data, this is before it was plowed in the gray, and soil resistance on your y-axis for each of the blocks. And what we see is that our 2012 data is generally lower resistance than our 2014 data after we plowed, opposite of what we expected. Um, we think this is largely due to that moisture uh, difference. It was, I wasn't there in 2012, but I've been told up and down it was wet, and that's going to affect our uh, resistance values. So instead of comparing 2012 with 2014, I want to look just at 2014 for the time being, because we have those control strips, we have the rip plow area, and we have our natural forest to all compare when they were all measured at a similar time under similar conditions. Um, so we can see some pretty clear trends. When we look at zero to 10 centimeters of depth, our resistance is the lowest in the forest soils, and we have that forest floor there. So it's nice and fluffy, it's easy to penetrate. In the control areas, it's the most resistant, for the most part. There's always outliers you're gonna find, and that's pretty normal even in the natural forest soils as well. Uh, as we move a bit deeper, however, we see that the forest is not so decompacted or so uh, it's actually resistant or more resistant than some of the control areas. If we get deeper, it doesn't show it here, but uh, the forest soils are still very uh, resistant, resist, highly resistant, and um, our rip plow sections are now uh, either improved upon or at least very similar to our forest resistance values. Um, but I can go back to that 2012 data because I want to look at the variability in that data, to, to look at heterogeneity in the data. Um, and uh, comparing that with our 2012 in the gray, 2014 in the blue, and the forest uh, resistance values in the green, this is the coefficient of variation, or the standard deviation divided by the mean, um, just to get an idea of the spread of the data, how variable it is. Um, and we see that the control, or 2012 data, is showing the smallest amount of variability, it's the most uniform, whereas our forest soils at zero to 10 centimeters are highly variable. You have areas that are deeper forest floor, you have hard roots, you have wetter areas, you have a lot more things going on in that natural forest stand, which accounts for that variability. Um, and the rip plow isn't really matching the forest at that top 10 centimeters of soil, but as we get deeper in the soil, the rip plow is actually in some cases becoming more variable than our natural soils. Um, so I actually want to tie this and make it, make it a little bit spatially explicit. So look on the ground, we can have a big spread of values, but those values can be near each other in space. So a quick geography lesson here um, to try and explain this moran's eye, and I'm the moron here that will try and explain this to you, but bear with me. Um, near things in space are usually more alike or more similar and we call this spatial autocorrelation. And they, we can measure this through a thing called Moran's eye, which is a correlation coefficient, very similar to uh, Pearson's correla uh, correlation coefficient, if you're familiar with that. Ranges from negative one to positive one, negative one being highly dispersed values, uh, very dissimilar in space, whereas positive one values mean that similar data points 
on the ground are near one another, so there is less local variation, and it's that local variation that we're interested in. Uh, so if we look at our results, they're pretty much all random in the top 10 centimeters of the soil, uh, kind of regardless of which block you're looking at and which treatment. Um, but if we go deeper into the soil, there's actually some trends that might emerge. Uh, we see that the forest soils are a lot more clustered. And these values aren't exactly strong correlation. Less than 0.2 isn't a strong autocorrelation. But it does show that the forest is a lot more patterned, I guess you'd say, regionally compared to our rip plow valleys, especially. So we see these differences below ground, but do we see them above ground? And the short answer is yes, especially if you look at our white spruce, balsam poplar uh, total heights. Uh, this is from 2015. Our control uh, vegetation is usually a lot shorter, a lot less vigorous than the stuff you find on the rip plow. So the control is great if you want to grow a bonsai forest with nothing else but grass, but if you actually want to you know, have maybe merchantable timbers, timber sometime in the future and something other than grass, we have strawberries coming in, more native forbs coming in, uh, the rip pile looks to be much improved. So, and, and I just wanted to throw this slide up here. This is um, showing soil resistance values from a number of sites in our region, just to show you the range of natural variation. So we have in the blue box and whisker plots, these are the resistance values um, from our site that I just talked about today, the three forested plot blocks. Um, but we see there's a huge range of variation and there's really no normal, there's no magic number to shoot for with your resistance values. So you have to be careful in applying, is aiming for natural is actually something we should be doing or just working with our decompacted soils as they are. Um, so some conclusions from this is that the forest, no surprise, is much less resistant and more highly variable at 0 to 10 centimeters. But as we get deeper, our data is showing that the rip plow is making the soil uh, less resistant even than we, what we find in nature. And it's also increasing that heterogeneity in the soil uh, resistance values. So ripping doesn't return a site to natural by any means, but it does probably make it more conducive to growth. And there's really no um, way to recreate that natural forest in, a, in the short term, but we can probably kickstart things by decompacting. Um, so this data, it can be really useful, but it's really tricky to apply. You have to make sure that you, uh, you collect your data at the same time under similar conditions so you can make meaningful comparisons, as we have learned from this little project here. So I'd just like to thank our summer staff collecting data and our funding partners.